I think one of the things uh, we all have to realize in the world of cardiac surgery is that we live in a high risk world and that uh, the world of risk within cardiac surgery breaks down into various phases. In fact, my colleagues, Dr. Frank Fazilari that you see listed here and Rich Prager did some really good work in this area and published back in 2012 in the annals what's, uh, when we actually use this algorithm at uh, my facility and it's called POCMA, P-O-C-M-A. And what that means is it's the phase of care mortality analysis. It's really understanding where do complications occur in cardiac surgery. And we see by this graph that there's a, uh, two bars really stand out, right? Obviously it's preoperative. And what does that mean? It's really the preoperative selection and evaluation of the patient. This is an area that there can be misses. And these are areas that really the physician and care team have to focus on to understand are they evaluating the patient correctly. But the other big bar that stands out and the one that we'll be spending a lot of time uh, talking about in this session is right there in the ICU. Up to 25% of mortality can be traced directly to the ICU care of the patient. That's the phase of care as they leave uh, the operating room and are there until they can transition to a telemetry type bed. So one of the things that we wanna look back on, kind of where we've come from and where are we going, the conventional approach or the approach that has been really dogma for many years uh, within the surgical world. And in fact, when I trained, I can think back to my uh, intern days, I'm old enough to say that now, that really we actually used to calculate the amount of fluid based on the patient's weight, the type of operation, and the type amount of insensible loss that we thought we would encounter. In the cardiac world, I kind of came upon fluids were bad and that the restrictive approach was really the way to do it and that you wanted to run patients, quote unquote, dry. And that meant really restricting the amount of fluids that were ever administered to the patient, both during the operation and after the operation. And certainly there was no concept of prehydration or letting patients uh, drink clears up to the time of surgery. Um, so really, we were counting on mostly pressors at that time. Finally, uh, when you, uh, where we are kind of today is understanding that neither of those two approaches are really ideal for the optimal care of the patient, and that the optimal uh, care is probably a more goal-directed therapy. And what does that mean? It means fluids and pressors both have a role and can be used, but they should be used really with the end goal in mind. And what is, what is that? The end goal is really tissue oxygenation, oxygen delivery. And that's achieved by optimizing and individualizing the hemodynamics that lead and build into that, such as stroke volume and delivered oxygen capacity and appropriate transfusions and really um, understanding the cardiac output index for each patient. So one of the unique aspects of cardiac surgery, and I think this slide says it all there uh, on, the, on the right hand side of the screen, is that we live in a complex world, I said, and, and really this, uh, there's nothing more complex than a patient on cardiopulmonary bypass, or unless we talk about those patients who are on ECMO, very similar. And we know that bypass itself, although it's, it's necessary, as I always uh, used to joke and tell my uh, residents that it's not a state of being, that our goal is to get in and get out of this operation and uh, inevitable periods of time on bypass are not good for the patient. And that it's really a tool that we should use because bypass involves non pulsatile flow it does involve activation of inflammatory cascade through cytokine release. Uh, it can often result in vasoplegia. We know that we're altering the clotting cascade just due not only to the administration of anticoagulants, but also because of direct rheological factors and perhaps damage to the uh, comp blood uh, cell components. And that there are gonna be massive volume shifts, especially in patients with low albumin or poor nutrition. These patients, particularly on bypass, can have massive volume shifts. So what it takes is, um, really a team uh, that's really multidisciplinary, talking about our anesthesia colleagues, talking about our intensivists, and of course the cardiac surgeon and, and certainly the perfusionists and all of our care team, to now take what was uh, a standardized kind of thing and uh, rather what was done as an individualistic uh, type thing from surgeon to surgeon having great variability to get adding some structure around this and making it more protocol driven. So this kind of really brings us to what does hemodynamic uh, monitoring and cardiac surgery today look like? And what we realize is that it's really a continuum of care, right? That there's, uh, the care really starts pre and post the induction of anesthesia. That involves a period of time on bypass, a period of time coming off bypass, uh, the very critical time of when the chest is being closed and further hemodynamic perturbations can occur. And then finally the post-operative period where the patient lands in the ICU 
hopefully normothermic, but could be potentially hypothermic and could have a lot more ongoing fluid changes. To really address that true continuum of care, it takes a multidisciplinary team, but it's really driven by some nice standardized protocols. But if people deviate, then of course we can uh, come in. And it's understanding that there are dynamic changes in patient status, that every, it's not cookbook medicine, but it's really more standardization of medicine to give us some guidelines on how to do things and to evolve uh, the way we uh, treat people and what our treatment goals are. So again, we just wanted to reiterate what's been going on in the past is tremendous variability in the perioperative period. And we know that variability uh, combined with incomplete knowledge is really what creates poor outcomes. When you look at any center, it's very hard to achieve good outcomes if you have high variability. The people that realized this very early on were our colleagues in industry and in manufacturing. And that's certainly not to equate what we do in the operating room to, to making widgets or making cars, but it's that we can learn from other disciplines and, uh, and really take knowledge from them. Uh, concepts like Six Sigma and lean processing actually have uh, a place even in our world of medicine. But it's understanding that high variability from operation to operation, from patient to patient, from operating room to operating room actually does not create great results. And uh, many famous centers around the country and the world have realized that, you know, it's got to be, can't be a flood in one area and a desert in the other, the way we volume manage patients, but it really should be standardized to some goal-directed therapies. Next slide. So what we know uh, in the current world today is that there is a large variation in the way perioperative fluids are administered. And we know this because the strongest predictor of the intraop fluid administration was not the patient, was not the uh, uh, situation or the operation, it was actually the provider. And that high variability is shown with only 50% of cases falling within that nice tight range, which is about four to 10 cc's per kg per hour range. And that 85% of fluid boluses in the intensive care unit are often made by uh, either the bedside nurse or residents or advanced practice uh, providers uh, based probably on just their experience rather than on any matrix. So we know that one of the concepts that has been very popular for a long time uh, in, in cardiac surgery is that you gotta run patients dry, fluid restriction. And that we know that when you couple fluid restriction um, with limited cardiovascular result, reserve, meaning a poor inotropic state or a heart that's kind of coming off sick, what really ends up happening is that you create inadequate oxygen delivery. Earlier in our little discussion, we said that oxygen delivery really is what we're trying to create as the true end result of all of our interventions. And when you have inadequate oxygen del delivery, what you end up with is a compromised uh, organ perfusion and a compromised patient, really. So I think this graph really nicely shows, Dan, I thought maybe you might want to comment here. If you look at risk of complications that can occur when you run people just too dry in terms of organ hypoperfusion and really kidney injury and, and um, uh, tachycardia and so forth versus when you can really optimize it. Yeah, and, and I think that's great, Sinu. You know, the, the you know, what we see here is that there are problems uh, on both sides. There's a ditch on each side of the road here, to kind of use that analogy. We, you know, for the longest time, we thought, oh, you you got to run them dry, got to run them dry. And that's, I think we've switched from that dogma. But, you know, in the cardiac patient, but really across critical care medicine, uh, especially in kind of the medical critical care world, ARDS, we have learned that you know, air, airing on either side, being too wet, being too dry has all sorts of problems. And, you know, whether it's uh, ventilatory issues, you know, it, within the lungs, the kidneys themselves uh, taking a hit, um, the GI tract, you know, becoming edematous and boggy and not working well. There, there's, there's danger really on either side of this. And it just, uh, th throughout this process, as we've gone through this kind of at our institution, and, you know, I think the data is really beginning to, to build uh, across specialties even, when we optimize fluid status and st status and tissue perfusion and oxygen delivery in that critical perioperative period, we actually expedite uh, a patient's path through that, that really tricky time and get them back uh, to kind of their normal physiology faster. Um, so a huge opportunity for us to do this right. And there's a lot of danger if we don't uh, do it correctly. With the variability of fluid administration, it's so true, isn't it? That when you think back just a few years ago, uh, fluids are given oftentimes willy-nilly. 
So we should be uh, careful, if, particularly in those uh, patients with weak hearts and, and weak pumps. It's a much finer starling curve in those patients. Next slide. So what we're really talking about uh, up to this point is that we see that there, there are two extremes, the, the, the fluid restrictive and the, the kind of the volume heavy approaches. And what we'd like, really like to see is instead of being in either of those two camps and dogmatic, it's really a reduction in variation and the development of protocols and moving from a lack of a standardized approach and uh, leading to high variations in care and outcomes that we want to now uh, incorporate some technologies that are there to have continuous advanced monitoring instead of having to do intermittent thermodilutions. We want to have a framework for how to manage these patients, meaning rather the individual uh, istic or decided by the, the flavor of the day, person of the, the week that's covering the ICU or the unit, rather do it on a protocol-based uh, fashion and then apply it individualized to each patient at the bedside. And what we're going to look at is the volume, the flow, and the pressure uh, to guide us. So what we know is that there's a growing body of evidence that goal-directed therapy in cardiac surgery is really uh, seems to be the way to go to re both reduce variability and improve outcomes. It's one of the key things that can be improved upon is the reduction in acute kidney injury. I have to say one of the most feared complications, one of the ones that also shows up in the STS database, one that's tracked very closely uh, by, as a measure and a marker of quality in almost any cardiac program is the new onset or development of acute kidney injury. And that we know that by being much more meticulous with our perioperative hemodynamic management, that we can really improve the patient's outcomes, particularly related to the severity of AKI after cardiac surgery. And you can see here in the two groups, when you look at all AKI and then even uh, break it down into the moderate and severe AKI, you can see much uh, better, uh, or m great reductions in AKI in those patients that were managed in a more goal-directed fashion. Uh, along with, of course, implementing the entire Cadigo guideline package. And, and I think that that, um, you know, that uh, the kind of the point about the kidney injury is, is important because there, there are two key um, facts here. The first is that the, a very short period of time of hypoperfusion can really negatively impact the kidneys. And it doesn't take long. We have to be, you know, it, when the blood pressure is low, when the urine output drops, that has to be treated as a, a, an, an urgent thing that we need to address in the ICU setting. And I think sometimes we're too laissez-faire about uh, the urine output's down or the blood pressure's down. We got to jump on that. You know, that's an opportunity. And I think protocolized care can help us there. The other thing that I think is really important, and I've, you know, on the medical side, I've really had to explain this over and over and over to both our ICU nursing uh, colleagues and, you know, I think our medical doctor uh, kind of crew as we care for these patients is that when you get too full, when you get too full, we end up with a problem and, you know, the renal perfusion is not good. So a really high venous pressure is deleterious. It's problematic. Mm -hmm. And um, that's something we've really got to, uh, you know, kind of monitor. So again, it comes back to that, just the right amount of fluid, just the right amount of blood pressure is really important here. That's a great point. And, you know, we've had some colleagues that have really done some great work like Dr. Engelman and others, and have really looked into the nuances of kidney injury, but have shown us that uh, it doesn't take long. Like you said, uh, it, it's, you know, like we have code stroke and we have acute MI and ACS and codes called, but you don't really, we don't really call a code kidney, but we all kind of look the next time around and Oh, gee, the creatinine bumped. And then you look at the flow sheet and you see that the patient was hypotensive for up to three to four hours. But you're absolutely right. It doesn't take long. And that's something we really focused on uh, intraoperatively as well with the way we run our perfusion, particularly in people coming into surgery with CKD stage three or four. We're running much higher perfusion. But I think one of the key things that, that uh, couples with acute kidney injury, uh, as you pointed out, uh, Dan, is that it, first of all, it can, it can happen easier and earlier than you think. Number two, it it's, uh, uh, really alters the hospital course of care and pathway. But then finally, it's very costly. It's costly not just to that episode of care, but it's actually costly for care after uh, you leave. And it, the impact is lingering. So it can uh, raise it in the tens of thousands of dollars. And I think there's an opportunity to really, at least in a fifth or more of cases, to reduce uh, kidney injury by being much more purposeful with goal-directed therapy.